The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Um, remember, I wrote the optimizer talk that I just I gave a little earlier because uh, I, as a trainer, I needed to illustrate uh, how the optimizer was doing things. And although I could show specific queries, that really gave me sort of an overarching view of what was going on. Uh, this presentation has a similar history. Uh, as a trainer for Enterprise DB, uh, I often have to explain you know, how to do performance tuning. And, and as I'm talking at different levels, the query level, the explain plan, looking at explain plans, and looking at uh, settings at the, and configuration files, which I know um, is something that a lot of people talked about. Uh, one of the areas I found really was not very covered very well was the hardware level. Uh, and, and although you can, as a software developer, you can kind of not worry about that and just write your queries and write your job or Python or whatever and then not really get involved in what's happening underneath, uh, when you start to look at performance, uh, particularly for databases, it's really important that you understand that level of what's going on. Um, frankly, uh, I was always somebody who always loved that lower level stuff, so I was just a natural. Uh, I know we had a lot of guys when I was a consultant who really only understood the top part. And what would happen would be they understood the top part okay, but any time there was a problem, or any time something wasn't working right, they were kind of clueless in terms of understanding what was going on down at the bottom. Uh, and for me it was very easy because I could understand how that was all interacting uh, with, with the lower level. So uh, this talk is really about talking about hardware, again, something you probably maybe naturally would rather not want to deal with uh, as an administrator or as a developer. But honestly, there's gold in them there hills. Uh, there are so many areas where uh, we're leaving money on the table in terms of performance uh, by not really focusing on hardware. And I'm really going to basically present that and try and highlight a lot of these areas that, that where, where, where we do where people habitually are leaving money on the table and leaving optimization on the table that's really easy to get. And, it's, and that's why I wrote the presentation, to really basically underscore the importance of being clear to people that you know there's a lot of benefit here at the hardware level. If you just take the, just the, just listen to the talk. You know, just take the minimal understanding. So let's actually talk about this. Um, these are typically terms that people are concerned about when they're dealing with, uh, with optimization, uh, performance. There's a whole bunch of sort of studies about all these things. And when they're specking out hardware, these are the things they're looking at. Um, I don't mean to be contrary, but I don't really care about these things as a database person. Okay? Uh, you know, I'm not, that's a little facetious. I mean, I do care that your CPUs aren't 486s and you know, that you're not running some very archaic operating system or so forth. Um, but you're not going to find gold here. Okay? Uh, you might find gold. You're going to find gold here if you're doing rendering of graphic images. Okay? You're going to find gold here if you're doing a lot of network processing maybe or maybe a lot of text processing, a lot of uh, you know, uh, GIS stuff or just really very compute intensive stuff. But that's not usually databases. And a lot of the learning that we have to do as, uh, as database administrators is to basically go away from the focus on these specific issues um, and start to focus not this way, where we think of the CPU as the most important aspect of our system, and then we then think of memory, which, happens, which has to, it just has to be there. We don't really think about it. Okay. And then finally, we think of the I.O. layer, which is really kind of tragic because, in fact, this is how we should think of our systems. Okay. CPU is still at the top, but it's not really the focus of what we're doing. The focus of what we're doing really is down the I.O. level. And I'm sorry the brown's a little off, but it, it, you can still see it. Okay. And then the memory, and then the CPU kind of comes in as the cherry on top. Okay. And, and a lot of, there's just a lot of 
experience that shows that when you're thinking about your database, not your, not your file server, we're talking about your database system, this is what you should be, should be, how you should be viewing that system. And we habitually get people coming to the Postgres list, particularly the, the performance list, saying here's a, here's a server I'm thinking of getting, and here's the specs I'm looking at, and um, you know, I, I see it over and over again. Yeah, okay, we're gonna be, there's gonna be eight cores, they're gonna be running at this speed. Uh, they might mention the memory. They're gonna mention how much memory is in the system usually. And then the I.O. is like, well, I plan to have 10 drives and they're gonna be looking like this. Or I'm trying to, you know, and there's, it's sort of just thrown in there as, as an afterthought. And when they're asking, they're not asking about what I, what, how much memory they should get. They're not usually asking about how, what I.O. subsystem they're getting. They want to know, should I get this faster CPU or these slightly slower CPUs with more cores? We don't, you know what I'm saying? And you're like, wake up, this is not, you're not even in the ballpark here. And again, we'll gently tell them, no, t t tell me about your, <laughs> tell me about your IO subsystem. Tell me about your, then we're worried about it. And the problem is most of the people we're specking the systems out are spending way too much money to get the fastest CPUs and way too little money down here. Um, and you might think down here is just, well, do I get a 57, you know, what, what, is it just a hard drive type I get? Is it how many hard drives? Is it RAID 10? Is it RAID 5? What, is that all? No, there's, there's, a, there's many, many things down here that are not obvious to non-database people, okay, that really will make, I'm not saying 5, 10, 20, I'm saying like they're going to make 10 times, 100 times for performance improvements in some cases. Okay, when you can plop down $300 and get 100x improvement on some operation, I, like, I'll take that every day, right? And what you don't want to do is be spending that $300 up in that red area and then leaving that $300 out of the I.O. subsystem. And that happens over and over again. So in fact, I think the last time I presented this, somebody basically said, can I take this and show it to my the people who buy our hardware, because I can't communicate to them that they're doing it wrong, right? Um, and again, this web, this as, long, as well as all my other presentations are on, oops, are on my website here. So I just told them, yeah, download it, Creative Commons license, go present it, you know, go, go wild, right? So hopefully it's helping people. Um, I don't know how much it's helping people, but I hope it's helping people. So why is, it, why is this, where, why is it this mismatch? What is it about? Uh, databases that, that we really don't get, okay? And that is that traditional servers are, are normally CPU constrained, okay? Uh, you know, HTTP, email, application servers, application code. Obviously, these are, these are often bottlenecked by CPU. And we have nice graphs, you know, where we can basically, uh, you know, go into our systems here and let me see if I can kind of pull it up. Maybe I can't, but... Um, you know, nice graphs that show, okay, you know, these CPUs are doing this and these CPUs are doing that. Well, uh, okay, you know, that's, that's interesting, but, but again, most systems aren't CPU constrained, okay? Most database systems. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I'm going to go and look at a database system, uh, <clears throat> you know, the classic case is that the customer's saying the system's too slow, and you get on their system and you look at the CPUs and they're all idle. And you're like, well, you know, the customer's like, why is my system slow when all my CPUs are idle? Well, have you, th th uh, you know, the, dis the display's working, right? I mean, those CPUs are really idle. What could it be, right? And then, and then you have to basically walk them through the process, and 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 you start to look now at, you know, okay, is the I/O the bottleneck? Is it, is it lack of memory? Is it configuration? I mean, it could be a whole bunch of things in that stack. Um, but often it's shocking to them that they've got a CPU, they've got CPUs that are doing nothing and, and you know, systems that are, are really slow. And, uh, so basically what database servers do that are not a lot of other applications do on computers is a lot of sequential scans of a lot of large data, which again is not typical. A lot of random I.O., particularly for index access. Again, not a typical thing uh, an application would do. Uh, it has unpredictable requirements because, again, you can throw almost anything at it. Uh, and you have a lot of reporting requirements that, again, give you a very sort of asymmetric load balance. It's not like 
okay, you know, I get a thousand hits a minute, I get, you know, a thousand hits an hour, or whatever my load is. Um, these databases often, you know, go from very idle to very busy, <laughs> back and forth. Um, and again, that, that kind of throws havoc on, uh, on requirements as well. So any questions so far? Good? Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about this slide for a little bit. Uh, it's really necessary to kind of understand where that gold is, as I said before. What is it about the I.O. system that Postgres is doing? What is it that is making your system often go slow? Well, uh, this slide, which actually appears in a bunch of my presentations, actually has two parts. Uh, the part on the left is basically uh, what we call the query or checkpoint operation. Um, and normally, effectively, what happens is you've got three Postgres sessions running here, and they're just reading and writing to this shared buffer cache. So anything you need to read or write is going to happen in that shared buffer cache. We can't use the memory, the local memory in these sessions, because, of course, if you change something in your local memory, nobody else can see it, right? So we've got to use this shared buffer shared memory area to do all of our reading and writing, okay? Um, and this is typically going to be about 25% of your RAM, and, and, you know, there's a whole, you know, wizardly uh, process of, of, of sizing that. Um, but effectively, uh, if a backend needs some data, it's first going to ask for it in the shared buffer cache. If it isn't in the shared buffer cache, it's then going to ask for it in the kernel cache. If it can't find it in the kernel cache, it's then going to go to the disk. Okay, and then read it up into the shared buffer cache. It's going to stay in that shared buffer cache for some period of time. Okay, and then be reused by other sessions. The right-hand side actually talks about another area that you might not be as familiar with, and that's the area really related to transaction durability. So effectively, every time we change some data in the shared buffer cache, we also have to write something to this area called the write-ahead log. And the write-ahead log effectively represents a sort of a change set or a change log of everything we've changed in the database. Now, of course, it sounds like it's double writing, and in fact it is. But there's some real historical reasons why we have to write this write-ahead log, because um, databases uh, as Postgres, uh, enterprise databases as Postgres is, one, um, has a requirement for durability. And effectively that means that if a committed transaction um, is, if a transaction is committed, it's committed permanently. If the system loses power or the operating system crashes, we will be able to recover that committed transaction and restore it fully. Um, and because of that requirement, effectively, every time we change something here, we write it to the write-ahead log. And then we all have to write that write-ahead log not only to the kernel, but to some durable storage so that, again, if we lose power, we can restore that transaction. This is that operation called fsync. You can actually see it in the config file. Uh, you can control the method we use, the kernel call we use for fsync. But you've got to really write it to the, some durable storage, or you're really not an enterprise database because you're not ASIC compliant. Okay. So um, there's some other stuff here. Uh, recovery, for example, means rereading the write-ahead log and reapplying the changes. Uh, checkpoint happens when we actually write all these shared buffers down to disk, and then we can recycle the write-ahead logs. But again, that doesn't really apply in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the actual context that we're talking about it. What we're really talking about is this, is this traditional F-sync. And this is, this is one area where we really can get really slow. Uh, and and you, might, well, you might say, why? Well, okay, so let's suppose you have tr a traditional, you know, you know or, or even a high-end $15,000 SAS. 15,000 RPM SAS drive. So, you know, kind of high end, um, at least in terms of magnetic drives go. Uh, how many F sync operations can we perform on a 15,000 RPM drive? Well, um, if you do the math, again, you're talking 15,000 circles a second. Um, and of course, you have to wait for the, the head to get, the, you have to wait for the data to get under the head so you can get it onto the drive. So, even in this fairly high-end magnetic drive, you're still looking at about only 250 F-syncs a second. Yes? No, an F-sync is basically the ability to write some data permanently to some permanent storage. So it's basically a kernel call that forces 
the, normally when you issue a write, the write just goes to the kernel and sits there. And then within the next 30 seconds, it gets written to disk. Oh, the minimum size. No, it could be it could be just the transaction commit number. So it, it could have already whatever data change you made could be already there and it's just basically you're sending transaction committed. It could be, you know, sixteen bytes. But it's really as you said, it's really latency that we're looking at here. So it's it, the requirement is we don't really, I mean, we rarely, well, in this particular example, I'm, I'm assuming that whatever data we're writing is so small that how much data I can push through there is really not my concern. My concern is that, um, my concern is that effectively I have to wait for this data to get down to some permanent storage and then back up again before I can consider my transaction committed. Oh, you've tried. So we're, we're basically going to, we're not going to commit the, we're not going to, we're not going to tell the client we're, we're committed. 
until we've acknowledged that that data, that write analog data, has gotten to some permanent storage. Okay? And it's really that latency, how long it actually takes versus 8K versus 16K. Probably not significant considering the latency of a magnetic drive, which is like huge, right? Um, yeah, it would have some effect, but probably minimal. It's not really a concern. Um, so this is really the way um, the magnetic disk stack works. Um, in fact, they have broken it out a little bit. So uh, we still have the write-ahead log, we still have the kernel buffer cache, we still have the magnetic disk, but I basically kind of split it out. So what we have kind of under the kernel is typically an HBA controller, host bus adapter basically, um, could be a RAID controller, which is, is typical in, in enterprise machines. Um, and then underneath that, you're going to have a disk cache, which is going to be on the same device as the disk drive. Um, but again, it is, it is a cache, right? So it's, it's some memory that's sitting on the drive. It could be some of them are like a gig. I mean, they, some of them are pretty big, right? I mean, they're, they're actually kind of sizey uh, for the larger drives. Um, so effectively, when you're writing down, you have to decide, okay, when, when do I get my acknowledgement, right? So um, this particular case, we're gonna, the f is going to be passed from the kernel to the RAID controller. RAID controller is going to pass it down to the disk cache. If the disk cache is called write, is write through, that means we're going to write it all the way down to the disk. We're going to wait for that head to platter to get to the right spot under the head. And then we're going to acknowledge it and send it all, all the way back. If it's write back, that means that as soon as, it gets the, as soon as it gets the data, it acknowledges it right away. Even though, in this case, it, there may be no guarantee that this is actually durably stored. And of course, this is a concern for database people, not so much for other people, but for database people, this is what we care about. And of course, this is some of the things that you have to care about to have a reliable system. Okay? So um, let's kind of let's break this open a little bit. Um, we've got this problem here, as I showed before, where we're, we're going all the way down the layers, and we might have a disk cache that's right through, it might be right back. Frankly, in this case, if, it, if this disk cache is right back and there's no battery on this thing, we're, in, we're not safe. We might be flying. We might be going really fast, and your F-Syncs might be super, super duper fast. In fact, we have a tool called PG Test F-Sync in Contrib, which will basically test how quickly you F-Sync. And if you're F-Syncing to a magnetic drive and you're doing it more than 250 times a second, and it'll tell you per second what your number is, then odds are your, your disk cache is lying to you and you're potentially open for, to lose data or corrupt data in the event of a power failure. Okay? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's actually something we've been kind of working on. The PG test F sync kind of helps you pretty much to kind of know what your number is. And then we also have some documentation. So um, there's actually a tool that we have, a link that we have to a tool which will. Um, you run the tool on another machine and you let it continually write to your other machine over a network, I think, and then you shut down the machine and you bring it up again, and then it'll, it'll, basically, it'll basically reconnect and check to see if the data has been lost between. So that, that's actually a pretty cool tool. I was kind of neat how they did that, but you run it on another machine and it connects in and then runs and then you can basically, you know, a couple power failures will tell you right away. And the nice thing about that is it's checking your entire stack, you know. 
um, and making sure that that stack is durable. Again, most people don't care about this, but databases people have to. Okay. Um, now, one thing that, that really, here's a piece of gold right here. Um, and again, something a lot of people don't really realize. Um, again, this F-Sync data is not super huge. Um, yeah, it's going to be, you know, a couple K or maybe a meg or something. But again, um, not really large in terms of, in terms of modern hardware. Um, so one of the things that can really give you a huge benefit is to get a battery on your RAID controller. Uh, again, I'm, I'm ballparking a $300 figure here, but it's probably less than that now. Um, Postgres has always wanted the ability to have some small amount of static memory that was non-volatile, you know. And we wanted this for 15 years, and the first five, seven years, it just wasn't available. And about, you know, 2004, 2003, some of these sort of batteries became available in the RAID controllers. Again, normally only at the high end. And this has basically now moved down into more of the commodity stuff. Um, but basically, by having that battery there, an F-Sync can now be acknowledged right away. So I'm not waiting for that magnetic disk to spin around anymore. I'm basically saying, OK, I got your data. Boom, I'm done. So instead of getting 250 F-Syncs a second, I'm getting 10,000 F-Syncs a second. And as you can imagine, that improves throughput quite a bit, right? particularly for write-heavy workloads. It doesn't do a whole lot for reads, but for write-heavy workloads, again, it's giving me the same durability, but again, I'm getting that, I'm getting that stuff through so much faster now because I'm no longer throttled. Yes? No, the, the battery is basically going to be on the RAID card. I do have a picture of one a little farther along. Um, and the RAID controller is often going to turn off the right back cache that might exist on the drives. Because of course, as soon as we're, because we're doing right back up here, we're willing to wait as long as necessary now to get this data to permanent storage. Well, the good RAID controllers will effectively allow you to go in, set that cache because the battery's there to write back, and now allow, and then it will also, all the drives it connects to, will make sure it turns off the write back cache on the control the drives and make sure the data writes straight through. Okay. Okay, so there, that's with the battery. So the battery basically maintains the memory um, until the system comes back up, which uh, typically it's going to maintain the memory for like 48 hours or 72 hours. Or the newer controllers will basically have some flash memory on the controller card. And the battery, as soon as it loses power, will use the battery not to maintain the, mem the volatile memory, but to write the memory to the non-volatile flash, then when it comes back up, that way you can be down for a long period of time. Then when it, come, it gets power again, it will first thing we'll do is read off the flash, read it back into memory, and then force that down to disk. Right? So it's really quite, you know, that's a tremendous thing uh, in terms of allowing you to do And again, you can see people who were up in this, worried about the number of CPUs and the speed of the CPUs, are missing a lot of this real, you know, really tremendous stuff, uh, particularly again for OLTP write load stuff. It, it just, you know, it, you can basically do it. You can you can throw away durability and do it fast, which people don't really want to do. Uh, you can have durability and do it slow, which people don't want to do. Or you can have durability and fast if you get something like this. Uh, another way of doing it is, and this is the way I personally did it for my home server, is to get a, a, a drive with a battery on it. And again, this is typically not a magnetic drive for reasons I'm not going to go into. Um, but some of the nicer SSDs will basically have a battery on them. Um, the particular drive that we like the best is the Intel 320s. Some of the earlier drives had, without batteries really had problems. Um, you might think, oh, well, it's an SSD. I don't need a battery. I wish that was true. <laughs> um, but uh, we learned very early on, of course, you know, SSDs, everyone said, oh, wow, 
great random I.O., you know, it's going to revolutionize the database market, and, you know, people sort of ran to them. Um, of course, many of the early SSDs had serious problems, particularly in their microcontrollers and the way they, they, they managed the, the, the NAND memory that was inside of them. Um, but a bigger problem from the database perspective is something that really wasn't clear in the early years, and again, I'm thinking 2008, 2007, um, some, some since 2000, early 2009, where it really wasn't clear that um, this drive was not just NAND. And I think that, that was really a shock, because you, you can see right here, I, I have the same level as I did for a disk. See where the disk cache is? I still have a cache. And you're like, well, why is the cache there, right? Because, because I'm writing to an NAND now. I shouldn't need a cache. Well, you actually do need a cache because unlike what we think of, um, the, this NAND memory is not sort of like RAM. It's not like, you know, DRAM where you just randomly access and just store it wherever you want. And, you know, it, you basically, the, the NAND to, um, to function properly and to have a long dur durability basically wants to write in big chunks, and the chunks are big, like 128K big, right? So to do that, effectively, this, this state, this, you know I said disk cache here, it's not really, a, it's a staging area, because the, the, the DRAM, the, the, the SSD manufacturers effectively want to bundle a bunch of writes into this staging area and then only occasionally wipe out an area of, of, of NAND and then write those into the block. Josh, you want to say yeah, something? That should be a little different from uh, the, the way we label things as drives, because those come with the NAND memory and they Well, uh, yeah. The next slide is the is the um, is the is the, the DRAM. So let me. We're going to get to that. So, so one of the things that um, that people need to remember here, and again, this is uh, for some reason it took us a long time to figure this out. It just wasn't the manufacturers weren't really clear what was inside of the thing, and some of the, the volatility that we didn't really understand. I know Greg Smith did a lot of work on this, a lot of research, and actually went to a lot of customers that had early SSDs and was seeing regularly data loss from power failures. And then sort of had to really dig in to find out exactly what was going on, because they just don't really want to tell you. They'll tell you that we're non-volatile, but they don't really want to tell you that they're volatile, right? I mean, they don't really want to tell you that. So uh, one of the things that you have to realize is if you're using an SSD that doesn't have a battery here, okay, you still need a battery on the RAID controller. Um, in fact, you could argue that in some ways an SSD is worse than the magnetic case. Because in the magnetic case, you can set the disk cache to be right through and go right to the drive from the RAID controller without adversely affecting the life of the drive. Okay. In this case, if you have an SSD that does not have a battery, and you have a RAID controller and you put a battery on it, and you tell the RAID, and the RAID controller will say, I don't want any caching here because I don't, believe, I don't believe this level because it has no battery, all of a sudden you're doing a lot of these little tiny writes to the SSD. And your SSD is not going to last as long. Because again, the mean time between failure and the longevity of these drives, unlike a magnetic drive, which will basically write as many times as you want effectively and keep spinning effectively, there's not a known limit. Of course, they won't spin forever, but there's not a known limit. The SSDs actually have a known life cycle for those read-write cycles. And by disabling the write, by, by making this a write-through cache, and effectively disabling the staging ability, you are really diminishing the life of the drive. And if you run uh, smart CTL, you can see the, the life of the drive going down. Um, yes, sir? What is the right cycle limit for NAND flash? So what is the right cycle limit for NAND flash? Um, 
you know, we, we've had a lot of discussion about that. Um, you know, if you're using, if that drive is, you know, 50% saturated effectively forever, right, you're looking at about, you know, three, four years for that drive to, you know, to, to get, what would you say, Josh? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm looking, the, basically, I'm, the number I'm giving you is for the Intel 320 SSD. Yeah, and that was the last generation. Which is, right, the last generation. The, the 700 series, the 720s from Intel, I think they have, like, what is it, a 5X longer? or they, they're, they're much more durable in terms of write cycles. So the, the enterprise -y version of the Intel SSD is the 7, 720? Okay. But it's really good. The way they make it durable? Yeah. To be reused, to, to yeah. Be, to be yeah. Especially if they're in a cabinet with other drives, yeah. which are all vibrating at the same time, and then heating as well. And yeah, it's, there's a lot of reasons why a drive should fail. You know, the, the, I think the real takeaway is that the the flash has an observable failure uh, time limit, whereas magnetic really doesn't have the same observable. So pretty much, I would say anybody running an SSD should probably be running the smart CTL daemon which will basically always be, and I have a blog entry about it on my website, but it'll always be looking for, um, you know, at the health of the drive and reporting when the health changes. Uh, and of course, you know, it's not a guarantee, but as, you know, running any kind of enterprise workload, anytime somebody can give me report about how healthy my hardware is, I'll take it, right? Um, so in, in every case, you're basically going to be able to see how that drive's doing, and you're going to get a report long before there's any problem. Again, not something you would normally do with, well, you should probably do it for your magnetic drives as well, because they will, they can start to tell you when it has a lot of rereads that it wouldn't normally be doing. Um, so you should probably be running that anyway and get reports about it. Um, you know, I have a, I have a SSD here that I've had for six months, and, uh, you know, if I do, if I just look at it, and again, this is part of my I have a blog entry, but uh, 
Well, actually, I should probably just pull up the blog entry because it would probably give you a better, a better view of what's going on here. Um, I believe it's down at the bottom here. Yeah, here it is. So this is, um, this is the smart CTL output for Linux Ubuntu. Um, and you can see uh, right here it's showing, ah, I'm sorry, my blog is too large to, uh, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that there. Come on, where am I? Uh, yeah, so here it is. So um, here it's reporting like the temperature um, and down here, yeah, media wear out indicator. And this is actually something you see on an SSD that you would not normally see in another device, in a, in a non-SSD device. Um, and it's basically indicating that, that the drive is fine. Um, you know, it goes from zero to 100 and it's currently zero. Uh, so I guess when that gets to be 80 or 90, you know, okay, I, maybe I need to do something. Um, but again, this has been running 24 hours for, you know, six months and it doesn't show anything. So I, I think, I, you know, I think you really have to be, you really have to be cranking on the thing, you know. Um, but again, I think, uh, I think if you think of SSDs and you look at the benefits you get in terms of random I.O., you know, it's such a win that it's unwilling to take that. Um, I think there's also a sense that, that we might be replacing SSDs a little more frequently than we would the magnetic drives, but not because it's going to fail, but because the technology is going to be improving so rapidly that, again, you know, I bought this six or nine months ago. I would expect within a couple years uh, that there'd be even much better stuff out. Um, and because the speed's so good, even copying from one SSD to another is, is even faster than I can see. I actually have, um, you know, uh, you can see here I have, this is an SSD and this is, uh, this one down here is a, is a, just a standard, you know, Western Digital 6200 RPM drive. And that thing's like a dog compared to, you know, um, so I, I think this is kind of important. Again, not something, you know, <laughs> can't tell you how hard it was to really figure all this out, right? Uh, but the Postgres people really being somebody who, group who really care about this stuff, um, you know, really are working on it. I often recommend if you're specking out hardware, please spec it out from a vendor who understands database workloads. Um, your good people are going to understand this. Um, your bad people are just going to throw you whatever they normally would give you any application, and that's obviously going to be suboptimal. I would say. Yes. Okay. So the the question is: Is this normal for a failure, or would it be? Um, would a UPS handle this would be the question. So um, a UPS in a normal system would handle this. Now, of course, if the power supply fails, then the UPS is not going to help me. Right. So with operating system kernel crash, we might, we might be able to get by because we might, if we can reset the system without powering off the de device, like if we have to, if we have to hard shut it and turn it on to get it back up, then we're going to have a problem. If we're still powering all this stuff, and we just hit the reset button, then this data is still going to be in the caches, I think, in the stack. So you're kind of right. I mean, I'm, I'm really talking worst case uh, for something like an operating, like a power supply failure or a case where you don't have a UPS uh, working. I, you know, I personally. You know, as my home system, I have a UPS, but again, the, I'm not guaranteed that the UPS is going to get the machine down in enough time to, for the, that it's going to last for the duration. Because if you've ever seen cases where uh, the classic, the, the, work, the classic, um, as much as I love my UPS, uh, the classic uh, pathological case is that you lose power, the UPS waits for the power to be down for a certain amount of time. Um, before shutting your system down, the power comes back on. That happens a couple times. Your UPS each time lowers its battery, and then the whole thing, yeah. So it, there's all sorts of weird things. And then there's even the, the problem where um, I've seen cases where you lose power, 
it brings the system down, but the power comes back on. The UPS doesn't realize that the power's off, so it has no way to re restart the server. Like, there's like a chicken and egg thing there, which also is kind of pathological. Right, right. And, and you know, it's, well, again, you, you can get into this chicken and egg thing where sometimes you want it to go down so that when the power comes on, you know it's going to come back up. Because as I remember, there was some, and I can't remember the details, but there was some problem where you, you, your UPS shuts the system down, but the power comes back on, and then, your UP, and then your system's down, and it doesn't realize it has to actually shut off the power to the device and then bring it back up again now that the power's back, because it doesn't realize that the system's down. Um, and I can't remember, I remember talking to somebody about it, and they're like, uh, yeah, I guess that would be a problem. So I, I'm, I've never been completely even happy with an auto shutdown, because the auto shutdown can in some times be worse than, and maybe somebody will email me and tell me, oh, that's not true anymore. But I remember being confused that if the power came back on while, the, <laughs> while it was shutting down, that it wasn't clear the UPS would understand that it needs to shut off the power to the machine and then bring it back up again. I don't, I don't really know how that's been fixed. Um, so, but you're right. I'm, I'm, think, I'm always talking pathological case, yeah. Um, so anyway, that, it's kind of interesting how that all kind of works and, and, and sort of that staging area. That's why we're recommending the, the battery-backed SSDs. Okay, so the question is, what do we do about, do, do file systems that understand Flash help us? Um, the only area I've seen where file systems are optimized for Flash is really um, a, an operation called, and, and Josh, you might be able to help me with this, um, trim. trim, thank you. And can you explain that to the gentleman? Right, right, right. The, the microcontrollers, yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically the now, 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 Josh, is this is this with battery back rate SSDs or normal SSDs? Huh? Is this with battery back SSDs or normal SSDs? You saw this. Uh, but not battery ones, because I'm saying I, I would think the. Right, right, no, but I'm saying that the staging area is, is battery back. So I would assume that it would acknowledge it very quickly as soon as it gets to the staging area, right? Yes. So I guess I'm confused. You're saying, you're saying you didn't see a right improvement going to an SSD compared to, were you comparing it to get onto the cache of the, of this, of the magnetic drive? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have, I can run actually the, the test F sync and we do have performance numbers on between the two. And I did see a pretty big difference. But I think part of the problem is that sometimes we're measuring just the time to here on these magnetic drives, right? Which of course is going to be about the same as this one, right? But the time to here compared to this is, is going to be staggering. Or so I'm not. Please. Excellent. Good. We're, we're, we're going to report back in a minute. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of interesting. The basic, what we have found is that um, it's kind of related to what Josh said. If you're doing sequential reads or sequential writes to these things in big chunks, it's about the same. So if you're doing a long write to a magnetic disk, again, it's going to just spew it all across that track. And, 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 and that's pretty much as fast as the SSD is going to do it. All right? Um, where, and the same thing with reading. Again, if you're reading a whole bunch of sequential data, think, think video streaming. OK? Video streaming? Like, stick with the magnetic disk. You need big ones. And you're not doing a lot of random I.O. And you're just like saying, go write this one gig onto this drive, or go write this one gig on the SSD, or read the one gig from the. It's just, it's not that big a difference. Yeah, it's slightly different, but as Rob said, it's not going to knock your socks off, right? Where you really see a difference is things like random reads, OK? Um, where you're basically randomly pulling stuff off the SSD versus a magnetic disk. That's where you're going to see your big, your big win. Numbers yet? No. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. So. It could be. Let me see if I'm still here. Hold on. I am still. Oh, I'm on the. I am on the. I am on the hotel wireless. Yes. Okay. So um, one more thing we should. So again, SSDs are great for random reads, random writes, and, and primarily random reads, I, I've heard, not as much random writes. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll specify, because we always kind of index that to a large table, Right. So I mean, the ideal case would be to have your heap tables. Well, I'm not sure if it's the ideal case, because you're going to do a lot of random reads to your heaps. OK, but if you're doing a lot of sequential reads from tables, put them on magnetic. And then when you're doing random stuff, it's going to do a lot of index access. Put it on the SSDs. Um, ideally, I'd love to say put your tables on the magnetic and your, and your indexes on SSDs. But the problem is your indexes are going to do a whole lot of random lookups into the heap and your tables. And that's going to generate a lot of random I.O. So yeah, it would be, I, I wish I had a better answer for that one. Yeah. Exactly.
Yeah, instead of four or, or higher. Yeah. And we do allow you to specify the random page cost per table space. So a lot of people are, are now, if they've, got, if they've got their data directory spread across multiple table spaces, they can now put that. I, I mean, you know, you sort of talked about what people did in the file system for SSDs. The only thing we had to do for SSDs, which is pretty astonishing, was to allow random page cost to be set per table space. That's it. We don't have anything else. We, don't, we can't think of anything else, at least, that would really materially impact what's going on. We already had random page cost. We, we did not have a mechanism to set, to have settings per table space. We added that a couple of years ago. Boom, we're done. <laughs> so it, it's kind of neat how that really worked out. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been, we've been really kind of happy with it. That's a great example where you're talking, your, your, your number, your, your random page cost is going to go down. And therefore, that, that, that query or that list that you saw um, uh, uh, in the previous presentation that had the colors and talked about the breaking point for various things is going to change as you change random page cost. Yeah. I didn't cover that in that presentation because it's just sort of out of the genre of what we're talking about. But of course, yeah, that, that, those color bars are going to move around uh, as you change those numbers. Uh, other questions? We're good? Good. Great. Okay. Um, the final one, which is, I think, Josh's favorite, uh, <laughs> DRAM storage. Uh, this is Fusion I.O., basically. Uh, Fusion I.O. is kind of a mixture of DRAM and uh, NAND and a whole bunch of other things, so it's not all DRAM. But uh, the point is that it's pr it has a large component that is effectively just DRAM or just very fast random. Yes. That's surprising. I guess we're working on it. I know the commit fest is on the 15th, so I guess they wanted to put it out. Oh, 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 I remember because I couldn't get, I was going to put something in. Or is that, that was beta one. No, never mind. Never mind. I was going to do something with PG upgrade, but I, I did it. So it's something else. Interesting. OK. So um, the important thing here is that you're, you have basically DRAM, which of course is very fast, doesn't have the staging requirements, right? The 128K block requirement. Uh, it's very fast, but effectively you have to have a battery on it, right? Just you're not going to get one without a battery. Whereas with SSD, some of them have batteries, some of them don't. In fact, you have to make sure you see the battery if you're running an SSD. Um, here you have to have, the battery just has to be there. It would be useless. Um, so effectively, you've got the battery here. Whether you need a battery, it doesn't really have a staging area in the same way. Um, do you need a battery on your RAID controller if you have this? I don't know. I'm really, I'm, I'm kind of unclear on that one. Um, whether it's worth having, you know, additional battery up there. I, I, I can go either way basically. Um, so uh, let's get into some details, I, I, just to kind of solidify what we've talked about. And again, a little bit is going to be, re, you know, going to be re, uh, rehashing some of the stuff we've done. Um, and again, I wrote this presentation because I just, I needed to communicate this to people. And it was not clear unless I had diagrams and really clear stuff. So I'm trying to be really clear about what we're doing. Um, and there's a lot of text on here, again, so you can show it to people and you can say, here, this is what I want. Um, so write back versus write through cache. Again, a write back would be it's acknowledging it right away. A write through cache is going to send it down to lower layers. Um, caching layers, uh, again, you can have it on the RAID controller. Um, you can control the, the draw, the you can control the cache behavior of the storage. Uh, there's actually some operating system commands that we actually do have in the Postgres doc, 
which tells you under Linux, under Windows, under FreeBSD, how do I turn off the drive cache? Uh, how do I make it right through instead of right back? And we actually have those commands for you. Um, typically, enterprise or SaaS storage is going to default to right through when you get it from the manufacturer. SATA consumer is going to be right back because, again, they're not as concerned um, you know, about, about data volatility because, again, they're just um, they're more worried about throughput, right? Um, HBA RAID caching, uh, again, um, you can usually go into the firmware of the RAID controller and, can, and set this up. Um, you know, you can make it non-volatile if you want, um, and then, you know, uh, it, it'll work fine. Uh, in terms of magnetic disks, the more spindles, the better. Uh, again, when we used to do it in the 90s, we get a lot of really tiny drives. Like, it would be smaller than the drives we would use on the desktops because we wanted all these spindles to really allow us to parallel uh, a lot of the operations that's going on. Um, I'm sorry, I accidentally hit the wrong button. Uh, please don't use RAID 5.6, it's way too slow for writes. Um, works wonderful for a file system, but we're not running a file system here, okay? Um, you really wanna, unless you're doing a lot, of read, a lot of reads and you're cache constrained, please use RAID 10 or, um, or at least RAID 1 so that you're effectively um, uh, not doing double writes every time because normally with RAID 5.6 you've got to actually write the two drives before you can acknowledge it. This is what we don't want to do, right? Um, uh, usually uh, SAS uh, is designed for enterprise workloads, again, for these reasons. Um, I used to think it was kind of hooey, but I've read some interesting things from Seagate and Intel, some of the white papers that talk about what they have to do to make an enterprise drive an enterprise drive. Um, and effectively, they're dealing with the kind of things we talked about, 24-hour uh, operation, heat, vibration, again, very common in enterprise workloads, not common when it's sitting under somebody's desk. Um, the big takeaway I got from this, and again, um, it's really up to you, but the, 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 this, the um, consumer drives are really um, designed to hit a price point. You know, you go on Amazon, you see how much the drives cost, and you, you buy one, uh, honestly. Um, usually the, the enterprise-y drives are really designed for reliability, and they put a lot of money into that. Contribed. It's always there. No? Yes, you're right. Yes, so now it's over there. But I think it wasn't, it wasn't this release we did it. It was some... Really? Oh, okay. So again, um, the enterprise stuff is much more, put a lot of money into it. In terms of like what, what they use to make the, the, the servos and the bearings, and there's a lot of crazy stuff there. Um, SSDs, uh, again, uh, NAND versus flash. Staging area, it's not just a cache. Um, be careful of running the SSD in write through mode because it can cause a problem. And here's a really good uh, blog entry, again, by Greg Smith talking about um, the use of Intel 320 SSDs. And while well, well, it was the first sort of affordable SSD that, 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 that we were ready to recommend. Uh, again, because it is a battery-backed one and actually is the one that I use as well. Um, I, yeah, that's exactly right because I assume, yes, because for a magnetic disk, it has to be right through, and there's no disadvantage in terms of drive lifetime having it right through. And I assume there is no battery on the magnetic, okay? For a SSD, it, I assume there's a battery, and I assume it's right back, okay? So the pathological case, the cases you don't want or a magnetic without a battery that's right back, and an SSD that's right through in any case, because you're gonna, you're gonna wear out that SSD much quicker as, as this gentleman was mentioning, right? So again, it's, it's kind of a weird case where turning, where you're, you're actually doing opposite things. That's a great point, I hadn't really thought of that, but um, it's definitely a problem, yeah. And I don't think it's as clear in this presentation as it should be, so I'll try and improve that. Um, XFS or EXT4, we really like those. We don't like EXT3 very much. 
Um, it has to do with the way it does f-sync and uh, basically orders the f-sync. ext 3 doesn't do it too well. We'll even take ext 2 over ext 3 so. Um, what's this? Uh, we have, we do not have enough people running that to know. I haven't, I haven't seen, yeah, I haven't seen, yeah, I haven't seen enough, enough stuff there. Um, some people move the xlog directory to another drive. Um, you can try turning off a time if you think that's going to help. Um, I, I haven't actually tested that one recently, it was years ago. Um, battery back unit, just to kind of redo that. Again, verify that the battery, also called a supercapacitor, physically there on the drive, so you should see it when you get it. Um, if you can't see it, look at the manufacturer's uh, specs. If they don't mention it, it isn't there. Uh, if they have it, they're going to be touting it. If it's not there, they're not going to mention it. Be careful. Um, they just make our job really hard. I mean, it's just really not easy to do what we're doing here. Uh, again, the battery might only last for a limited amount of time, although some of the newer ones have a flash that it'll write to. Um, if the battery goes dead, it will fall back to write through mode. A right back mode, a right through mode. So one of the interesting things about the battery ones, if the battery goes bad, it'll actually change the, the, the mode of the cache because it no longer realizes it's durable and it will then fall back to right through. So if your system all gets slow all of a sudden, it might not be obvious. Look at your kernel, it's going to tell you, hey, something's wrong. Um, you should be monitoring it and you should have replacements on hand because you don't want to wait a day while your system's crawling to put a battery in there. Or considerably more than a day, particularly if it's a weekend, right? Um, so that's actually an older uh, Adaptech controller. Uh, you can see the battery down here. In fact, that is the battery. Uh, and you can even see the wires. Uh, and it's just basically some, you know, some lithium ion batteries. See, it says right there. Well, particularly because I think you have to get in the BIOS and put the cache back. I don't really even know if the BIOS is smart enough to, you know what I mean? Like once it falls back, I'm not sure how you get it back, if you have to actually go in and change it. Or does it know, hey, I have a battery now, and it'll flip back to, to write back mode. I don't. You would, yeah, well, there is, oh, actually, you're right. There is um, the well, LSI, there's little, yeah, there's little command controller you know, mega raid controller, mega control something that'll go in and I'll just change it. Okay, thank you. Um, so network, network attached storage, um, again, nothing to matter with this, works fine. Just be aware that you're, you're using a shared resource here. Okay, shared resource, again, you're gonna have contention. Again, nothing to matter with it, just, you know, wonderful for administration and so forth, but, but it, is con it is, you are contending together. So don't be surprised if that's a problem. Again, for most systems, they're probably not high, high volume. Network attached storage is fine, but if you are really concerned about performance, most people are using direct attached storage because, again, it eliminates that possible contention, not only in the network, but in the network attached storage device. Um, RAM, uh, the more the better, right? Again, this is our second part of the triangle here. Uh, if you can get five minutes of your working set in there, that would be wonderful. Um, always use our ECC RAM. There's no reason not to. The larger RAM, the more RAM you have in your system, the more problem for failures. Um, there's all sorts of ways it can get corrupted. The more reliable your hardware is, obviously, the more reliable your database is. CPUs, yes, they're important. Uh, Postgres does not allow for parallel query, at least not yet. I know we have to work on that. Um, there are some cases where you will use a lot of CPU, for, particularly if you're using a lot of server-side functions, GIS processing, a lot of very complex index lookups. Those are going to use a lot of CPU. But the general workload is not. Um, and, and again, the only case where you, if the CPU becomes a bottleneck, consider it a win. I know that sounds insane. But my CPUs are fully busy, I am happy. What that means is I'm not waiting on I.O. It means probably everything's in memory. I'm now cooking as fast as I can. And then you start to worry about getting faster CPUs because you've done your homework under that stack to get yourself to that point. So that's, that's a win. And finally, um, when selecting hardware, 
the, just because something has the same interface doesn't make it the same. I know it's really hard to tell. You look at two drives, they look the same. You took the two memory chips, they look the same. But you got to really do your homework because, again, just because something has the same interface, steering wheel and a pedal and a key to char start it, doesn't mean they're exactly the same. And, and it's really hard sometimes to figure quality stuff versus stuff that's just thrown together. But if you want a reliable database, you have to have reliable hardware. As simple as that. And that's it. So thanks very much. I know you got to go. Uh, appreciate the questions. I think we had some good discussions. Sure. Any other questions? All right. We're good. Thanks, guys. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.